May I now call on Her Majesty Queen Rania of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to address us. And Your Majesty, I would like to express our gratitude to you because as a member of uh, the Foundation Board of the World Economic Forum and particularly as a very distinctive person in our young global leaders efforts, I think uh, you always have been a shining model of engagement in order to improve the state of the world. And I think everybody appreciates particularly your commitment to social affairs. And here I would like to mention education. And you actually have been a member of our Global Council on Education. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Her Majesty Queen Rania. In the name of God, the Almighty, Your Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani, Mr. Klaus Schwab, my colleagues in this humanitarian work, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Prayers be upon you. It's an honor for me for the change in. The, 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 the change, the new change is in an Arab country in Qatar since it is an opportunity for the whole world countries to hold themselves accountable in solving the issues and problems that affect the whole humanity. It's also our responsibility as Arabs to take part in an international forum and to give our input in an era that is uh, wit that witnesses ongoing changes. I would like to thank uh, the leadership of the state of Qatar for its uh, vision and uh, for uh, giving its sponsorship to the World Economic Forum and for hosting this international summit. None of us would be here if it weren't for your vision and leadership. Your ability to mobilize not just people, but the best in people, has pulled together possibly the largest and most talented collection of experts the world has ever seen a group able to draw on a wide reservoir of thought and perspective, exactly what we need to get the job done. Someone once said, justice is the conscience of humanity. When I look at the world today, I fear we aren't listening to our conscience because I don't see justice. I see Muhammad, an 80-year-old herdsman from Somalia, who lost his entire livestock and livelihood to climate change. I see Devli, a seven-year-old Indian girl who carried sharp, heavy stones for 20 hours a day ever since she could walk. I see Franca, a 32-year-old from Florida, university educated, forced into joblessness and homelessness and poverty by the financial crisis. Now multiply these stories by hundreds of millions, because that's how many people are suffering from extreme weather, child labor, and so many other crises where the burden falls upon the innocent. Muhammad, Devli, and Franca are found on every continent. Their names differ, but their stories are the same. Human suffering. Our humanity suffering. This glaring injustice, inequality, imbalance dominates our world. It pushes us to a place where international deadlock is the norm, where cynicism and mistrust are common currency. It builds a society around erroneous assumptions that tell us if just enough people are happy, then there's no need to change it. But just enough isn't good enough. For every day this continues, billions of people are at risk from poverty, disease, conflict, and climate change. Permanent scars are left on the minds and bodies of our children. Ir 
irreversible damage is done to the air, land, and seas of our grandchildren. And let me be clear, no country is left untouched by the inequality of the international system. Developed countries suffered nearly half of all global job losses, yet they make up less than a fifth of the global workforce. So, let me ask, ask you this. What does it say about our humanity when we let nine million children die every year before the age of five? What does it say about our integrity when we break our promises to put 72 million children into primary school? What does it say about our morality when we abandon over 600 million girls, adolescent girls, to poverty and prejudice? To me, it says international injustice is the symptom of a broader crisis, an international crisis of values. Because when the bottom line becomes our guiding principle, we know that financial value trumps human value. When we live in an unjust system, it becomes just a system, a system without values. Our world craves values. These fundamental human instincts, like compassion for the vulnerable, charity, forgiveness, and prizing peace over conflict. They're what Kevin McCabe calls the currency of grace. A currency based on the gold standard that every human has value, that they're deserving of respect, dignity, and opportunity. Because the only value is human value. Over the coming days and months, I want you to keep this front and center. Because we need these human values to drive the discourse of the World Economic Forum. We need WEF to remember what Warren Buffett refers to as value investing, where you invest in the undervalued because you recognize their potential. Well, right now, we need to start investing in our values. We need to start investing in the undervalued, like the poor and uneducated, and recognize their potential. And that's why you're here, to restore human values, to restore our conscience, to restore justice to the system, so that our children don't have to live with our mistakes or become destined to repeat them. And that's why the Global Redesign Initiative is so important. We need WEF's experience to navigate today's complex world, a world so interdependent that a fire in one part burns us all. We need to step outside our bubble, where leadership, government, and industry reside and rotate through the proverbial revolving door. We need to be inclusive and recognize that solutions must include opinions and ideas from developing countries, the private sector, NGOs, and youth. Even when you don't like what they're saying, you have to be strong enough to listen, to give voice to the indigenous and indigent, instead of deferring to profit. And we need to ask the tough question. Do we really represent others, or are we after our own narrow self-interest? Which is why now is the time to rebuild the system. Now is the time to confront the ch rising challenges of our age. The size of our task should not daunt us. The solutions exist. They're in the schools of Finland, which produce the best students, the hospitals of Canada, which provide the best care, and the parliament of Rwanda, which has the most women. They're in the projects of brave NGOs and the minds of groundbreaking social entrepreneurs. Our religions tell us we are only as strong as our weakest link that we should respect strength, not power. If we truly want reform, we need the strength to challenge our definitions of progress and our assumptions about the world. We need to remind ourselves that economic prosperity in and of itself is a means to an end, not an end in itself. So as we survey the landscape and see extreme poverty, violence, persecution and pain, we know that these indicators are what define our world today. And it's these indicators a new system should focus on. Because MDGs are just as important as GDP. And when we begin to see the world through a different lens, through a human lens, when we start to hold the currency of grace, believing there should be no economic value without human value, 
we realize that a key indicator of human advancement is education. How many children are in school? The quality of education of every child. Because our schools are incubators for the world we want to create. They're microcosms of the future, of our future in the making. Because it's in the classroom we'll beat poverty. It's in the classroom we'll defeat terrorism. It's in the classroom we'll steep our students in the principles that will save our planet. Most of all, it's in the classroom we'll teach our children to defend themselves against the misguided and malicious beliefs of others. In the long run, only education can bring about a new world order. Only education can make redesign a truly global initiative. So your task is not just to rethink, redesign, and rebuild the international system, but to revalue human values, restore them to public life, and remind the world how much humanity needs them. So let us listen to our conscience once more. Let us return justice to humanity. Thank you all very much. Now ask the panelists to join me here on the floor, His Royal Highness uh, Hakon of Norway, uh, Chair of the Young Global Leaders Redesign Task Force, Amani Abeid Karoumi, the President of Zanzibar and Chairman of the Revolutionary Council, His Excellency Ma Bao Tan, the Minister of National Development of Singapore, and as a representative of business, Mr. Arif Nakri, the founder and group chief executive officer of Abraj Capital. Please join me here on the podium. We had uh, two such rich opening addresses of um, His Highness the Emir and Her Majesty the Queen. Um, I think it would be appropriate to, to ask you to add your comments, uh, how you see it from your perspective. And I also would suggest that we address particularly also the value issue which was raised uh, by Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, your Royal Highness, would you like to start? Thank you very much, uh, Your Highness, Your Majesty, uh, Professor Schwab. Um, I wanted to thank first uh, Your Highness, uh, the Mir of, of Qatar, uh, for hosting us. Um, and of course, also Professor Schwab for um, uh, convening us all. Uh, and in my case, in particular, for putting together um, the young global leaders uh, that I've been part of for a few years now. Uh, a tremendous community, and I'll, I'll address that a bit later. Um, but uh, now for um, um, the question about values. Uh, also in Young Global Leaders, we've had several initiatives on values. Um, one is the Global Business Oath, uh, which is uh, about getting business leaders, um, leaders to sign a oath on the conduct, the best practice conduct, uh, that uh, they would like to um, both um, do themselves and live themselves, uh, but also as an example uh, for others to follow. Um, we also have uh, an initiative uh, called uh, Global Dignity, uh, which uh, goes into schools and has a conversation with school kids on, on dignity. 
Um, and these are, are some of um, uh, the ways that we can infuse um, values into our everyday life and bring it up uh, as a topic that we should have at the forefront uh, and not as something that is sidelined uh, when it comes uh, to our everyday business. Thank you. Who would like uh, um, to add, um, um, Mr. President? Yeah, sure, I would. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Schwab. Um, please allow me to begin by thanking His Highness uh, the Emir of Qatar for inviting us to his uh, beautiful country and also for hosting this uh, global event here, which is very, a very important event of our times. Uh, and again, I would like to, to thank Her Majesty Queen, uh, Queen Rani of Jordan, of the Hashimat Kingdom of Jordan, for her inspiring speech, uh, which touched on the critical issues of uh, our world today. And uh, the one thing that she has mentioned, which um, is critical to everybody, is education. Education is very, is very important. Uh, in our developing countries, we've been trying our best to address that, that problem. And we believe that education is the foundation and the uh, keystone for human development. Um, I know. It is not an easy task to provide education to everybody, but given the opportunity, of course, from the international community, and especially I'm talking about the developing world where I come from, uh, I believe that it's possible to achieve the intended objective of providing education to the majority of our people. And of course, that will open up the, the mindset of people and understand more about the human value. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, and I would like to use this opportunity again to, to thank also uh, your government for supporting this initiative from the beginning on. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, again, I would like to echo the uh, sentiments of my fellow panelists uh, and thank uh, Your Highness the Amir State of Qatar and also to Your Majesty Queen Rania. Uh, for uh, giving us a lot of uh, food for thought. Uh, as uh, Mr. Schwab has mentioned, uh, Singapore is uh, honored to be able to join our host Qatar together with uh, Switzerland and Tanzania as uh, co-sponsors of this uh, WF GS, uh, Gold, uh, Global Redesign Initiative, or GRI. Uh, I think before we uh, talk about uh, the uh, issues concerning uh, how we can um, foster a new uh, a global uh, framework in order to uh, meet these challenges. I, I would just like to uh, share or echo, uh, support the sentiments of uh, uh, Her Majesty uh, Queen Rena about the importance of values and particularly substantively uh, to uh, her highlighting of the value of education. Uh, I, I think uh, we, we all, uh, I dare say without exception, all of us, all our countries, share this desire to educate our young. But I think it is also important for us to foster this love for education among our people. And I think Sometimes when uh, governments and states provide education opportunities, uh, it is probably uh, sometimes not taken up. And by that I mean that this passion for education, this, uh, this, this passion among people to educate their children is not universal. Uh, in some societies there is, a, uh, there is uh, this uh, a value, valuing of education as a means of getting, of, of uh, giving their children a better life for the future. But sometimes this is not uh, there. 
And so, for example, in the case of Singapore, we have had to, we have been fortunate in that uh, we have, uh, our people value education, and so by this, the state can just provide these opportunities and those opportunities are taken up. But I know that there are some, there are some parents in, in, our, in, our, in our society who do not value this. And so we have to take, make that extra effort to get them to understand the importance of education. Because when it comes to a conflict between uh, um, providing or, or getting their children to work and giving their children education, some parents make the wrong choices and instead get their children to go to work rather than to be educated. And so we have had to make this extra effort to try to get people to understand the value of education. But certainly, as we have seen in Singapore, by having this passion for education, uh, this desire to educate their children, I think we have been able to do well for ourselves and for our country. And uh, I would like to uh, commend uh, all the countries who have placed education at the highest levels uh, for giving our future generations a chance to improve themselves. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, end my remarks here and hope that I'll be given an opportunity later on to talk about something else. Yeah, Thank you very much. Arif. Thank you, Professor. Your Highness, Your Majesty, I noticed when you were talking, both uh, Your Highness and Your Majesty, there was a single bird, um, which is a dove, a bird of peace that was fluttering around this uh, beautiful hall. And I was amazed, either it was by accident or it was by design, but it really, it really beautifully conveyed the message of what it was that you were trying to say. Sadly, I was looking for the bird to be here when I was talking, but I think it understands that business people can be quite tough, so it's not here anymore. Thank you very much for allowing me um, to voice the views of the public of the business sector. Um, the way I look at it is the world has gone through a heart attack. It has gone through a cataclysmic shock, um, which the likes, the likes of which none of us um, ever saw in our lifetimes. And this shock has had repercussions that actually till today have not worked their way through the system. I've been quite amazed how people that I listened to in the course of the last 18 months have been talking about and saying that the worst is over and the fact that the US pumped trillions of dollars into the banking system and to its local economy was enough and sufficient to get us over the edge. I think the euro proved to us and the crisis in the euro currency proved to us that we're actually just at the edge of a cataclysmic event yet again. We're still at a point where we can't take anything for granted and we can't begin to assume um, that we are past the shock system. Now what that tells me actually is that we're in the middle of this crisis, we can't help ourselves. And had we been alive in the 15th century and we'd been living through the tulip crisis that happened then, I'm sure we'd have been thinking to ourselves this is the end of the world. But it wasn't the end of the world and the world recovered. So the first lesson I take away from all of this is that the human race is a remarkably, remarkably resilient race. We have a quality to rise up and learn from our mistakes and move forward. And what that means is that if we look back to the depression of the 1930s and we think how bad it was, and none of us were alive or around at that time to work through its ramifications, but when we think to ourselves now that it must have been very bad. We have to remember that President Roosevelt gave us the New Deal as a result of the recession. But what it also gave us was the Third Reich and the Second World War. We cannot ignore that depression and recession can have consequences that can be good and bad. And we have to work through very carefully through this moment to ensure that governments around the world, the private sector, everyone acts in concert to make sure that the bad things that have happened in the past don't happen again. And I just feel one of the things that I'd like to point out is that in the West, we have a tendency right now to lead and veer towards populism. 
And populism, ladies and gentlemen, can be a very dangerous thing because when you elect someone every four years and they naturally respond to the voice of the populace, we can begin to have a very negative impact and effect that comes out of that, which taken to the extreme leads to protectionism. And in a globalized world like today, protectionism is the worst possible outcome you can have. There's a mathematical model that says that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil can cause a tornado in Texas. We are in a very, very interconnected world, and we must be careful that whatever we do, we're talking about the G20 today, we're talking about the G8, we really must understand that whatever we do, we must do together, and we must use this time of negativity and depression and recession to pull together and come up with a new world order such that when we look back on this time 15 years from now and echoing the words of your majesty, we can actually turn around and say we educated our children, we created the world into a better place. I think it's very important and I think business and the private sector actually has a crucial role to play in helping governments get there. Thank you, Arif. The um, title of this session is The Global Redesign Imperative. So, Minister, what is, in your opinion, the imperative? What for the global redesign? What do you, what do you see as priorities to be done, uh, particularly by so the, the task forces here and by the work we are undertaking over the next day? What is the foremost imperative? Well, I, I think speaking from the point of view of Singapore, I think uh, you were talking just now about uh, how we should keep uh, economies open and the protectionism is bad. I think we have learned the hard way that, uh, oh, we, we, as a small state, uh, we, we, are have, we have one of the most open economies in the world and we have discovered that it has uh, been to our benefit. And I guess uh, that is the reason why we, uh, we, we are honored to be able to uh, co-sponsor this initiative because we do have a vested interest in global governance. So towards this end, I think uh, we would like to share some of these uh, points and I would like to put forward some principles of three key principles uh, on what I see as the uh, imperatives for a new uh, global framework. I think first and foremost, um, Perhaps uh, self-evident, but we should focus on getting the fundamentals right. In other words, um, we need to acknowledge and to accommodate the, the new reality in the world. I think that the, the new reality is that we are living in a new multipolar world. It is no longer uh, a, a two-dimensional one. Uh, we need to also realize that uh, we need to buy, to get buy-in from many of the key uh, countries in the world. Post Kyoto, after the Kyoto Agreement on climate change, we've got to buy, get buy-in from the U.S. Of course, we've got to get buy-in from China, from India, and also from others. But always at not too high a political price. Um, the Doha Development Agenda that has been concluded here, that's launched here in Doha almost nine years ago, uh, does not require institutional reform but it requires political will, especially among the key players. And this is not easily accomplished, but it is worth doing. The, the second quick point I want to make is that we need more effective mechanisms to facilitate multilateral cooperation. Uh, and here I'm not just talking about climate change, I'm also talking about other global issues. The global pandemic, for example. Terrorism, for example. And as a result of this, I think we now have the G20, which is the, 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 that came into prominence as a result of the uh, financial crisis. But what I think we need to do as we continue, as the G20 process continues, is that it needs also uh, to be better defined. I think we have been talking about the G20's uh, uh, value, but it also needs to be more more consultative, more inclusive, more transparent in its deliberations because all countries, big and small, will be affected by G20's decisions. So this will require for the G20 deliberations to translate into action on a global scale. It will require the G20 to develop appropriate mechanisms to engage uh, a wider range of countries. And that's the reason why Singapore, Qatar, 
Switzerland, and over 20 other small and medium-sized countries have taken the initiative to form the 3G, the Global Governance Group. And that's to foster this constructive dialogue that I was talking about on coordination and cooperation between G20 and non-G20 countries. And last but not least, this is where WF comes in. If we want to be effective, we cannot just depend on governments. We cannot just depend on governments to engage and involve in global decision making. We also need non-state actors. We need NGOs. We need civil society. And so WEF, the GRI, all will play a key part in contributing to the debate on global governance for the 21st century. And so this particular initiative is, this, is, is a starting platform. It's a useful platform for all stakeholders, for governments, international organizations, corporations, academics, all the key actors to come together to share ideas to contribute towards a 21st century blueprint for global governance. Thank you, Minister. As it was uh, expressed already today, global cooperation is everybody's affair. Um, Mr. President, uh, what do you see as the imperative for uh, global cooperation, global governance? First of all, I would like to, to agree with my colleague here on the issue of uh, institutional reforms as being extremely uh, necessary uh, given the changing dynamics of the world uh, economy and especially after the inclusion of the major players you know, uh, who, who have um, contributed to the group of the G20, uh, G20 group. Um, we, we, must, we must accept the fact that the world has changed. It has changed very much, uh, given the fact that the, in the old days when the Bretton Woods institutions were formed, um, there were just a few players in this world, economic players, major players. And of course, there were times as the G7 plus another one, uh, which was G8, and then now we have the G20s. But the rules of the game are still the same old rules. Now, in my opinion, I think this is high time now to get those rules changed. Because if we continue like that, we'll see, a, we could see, end up seeing a major catastrophe in the world economic affairs. And uh, uh, I believe that the majority of us here would agree with the notion that time for change has come, and uh, indeed it's, it must be. This is the right time. Otherwise, if we don't do it now, we may never have the chance, we may never have the chance, have the chance to do it again. Thank you. Your Royal Highness, what is for you the imperative for global cooperation and global governance? Well, I'm not a politician, so I'll leave the priorities to the politicians. Um, but the way that we have addressed this issue in the YGL community, uh, I've been sharing uh, the steering group on the GRI process uh, amongst the young global leaders. Uh, and there's a few things that have um, been um, defining features, I think, of uh, our community. Uh, one is energy. Um, that there is a lot of energy when you enter a room of YGLs, you really feel that it's filled of people uh, which really want to change the world for the better. Um, and with the GRI process, that has just um, added uh, to that energy. Uh, so I think that's, that's um, a quite special thing. Um, this morning, with the help of Her Highness uh, Princess Mayasa and also um, fellow YGL Jennifer Carrero, we were able, uh, they were able to uh, organize a youth meeting uh, here in Doha. And uh, one of the girls uh, that were uh, saying um, something about uh, how youth could contribute, uh, she was saying that it's not only about giving money, it's important f that youth also uh, use time and go and do the job themselves. Uh, and I thought that was a really good point because it's when you meet people uh, face to face, uh, that is when uh, your morals are challenged and your ethics are formed. Uh, now that's also a feature I think is important to the YGLs. We see that many of the initiatives that have come out of this process have been bottom up. 
uh, and um, um, less focused on the overall structural reform. Uh, so I was very happy when uh, this morning uh, Mr. Richard Sammons also said that um, part of, of the feature that we have seen in this process is that a lot is actually happening on, on uh, uh, the bottom and then evolving uh, towards the top. Um, another, I think, feature is involvement. Um, diversity is our strength. Uh, so diversity in gender, uh, geography, uh, professions, ethnicity, um, etc. Uh, involvement of youth, uh, of the less fortunate. Um, and uh, we've also been focusing on utilizing technology in a participatory way. Now, so if I may give some examples on uh, um, the bottom-up, hands-on approaches and initiatives. We have uh, the Millennium Development Goals uh, People's Action Plan, uh, where it's focusing on what individuals and organizations can do rather than only uh, states and inter international organizations. So we can sign up and make pledges uh, to the YGLs on a pers more personal level. Uh, we have the Youth Task Force has been in more than 20 countries the last year, uh, engaging thousands of youth on what they think is the important thing uh, and what they think is the imperative. And uh, a very nice report has come out of that. Um, and uh, we have also other initiatives which uh, are probably a mix between the bottom-up and top-down approach, uh, like urban mobility. How do we think about urban mobility now that um, more people are living in cities than not? Uh, and we know, obviously, that um, uh, the amount of people in the world is increasing. Uh, how do we make that sustainable? We have the Civic Eyes, which is um, using technology in a new way to uh, enable voters to participate almost as uh, election observers in their own election. Uh, we have Yala Startup, for instance, which is focusing on um, on uh, entrepreneurship uh, in this region and also the Missing Middle Fund, uh, which is focusing on uh, the middle between the entrepreneurs, be between those that are eligible for microcredit, um, um, so those that have um, need a bit more bigger loans than the microcredit, uh, but do not have access to loans from from regular banks. So that's uh, that's the missing middle fund, um, and also a global curriculum on conflict management, uh, which uh, is also uh, taking form. And then we have a few um, initiatives that are maybe more structural. Uh, the Global Responsibility License, which is quite interesting, uh, looking at how we can make intellectual uh, property uh, readily available uh, to the poor and those who need it the most, maybe. Um, and also a 20 by 2020 initiative, um, which is focusing on oceans and how we can preserve uh, this great uh, value and natural resource. Uh, now, you're not going to be able to remember all of these, uh, but I'm sure that uh, the 40 plus YGLs that are here will corner quite many of you uh, during uh, today and tomorrow. Um, to talk to you about uh, these issues and, and uh, others. Uh, but you can also go online to um, uh, look at it at redesignourworld.com, uh, which is the website um, where we present our ideas. And that's also um, done in a participatory way so that others also uh, can, can um, post their ideas from outside the community uh, there. So, so uh, I think that says a little bit about uh, our approach. Yeah. <laughs> see, see young global leaders. I have to say, I have to say, <laughs> having been so much engaged with, together with my colleagues, Lord Malloch Brown and Rick Sammons, into this initiative, uh, what makes me really optimistic for the future of the world is the young generation. I think we have now a young generation which is really characterized by the changes we have seen in the 21st century. Those are people who are really thinking as global citizens. Those are people with a great social sensitivity. Those are people ready to engage. I think you are a very good example. Um, and I think um, so this is reason for optimism, but there is also a danger. If we do not fulfill the expectation of these new generations, 
So then we may be faced with a situation where we had first a financial crisis, so then we moved into an economic crisis. Now we have in many countries a social crisis, let's face it. And if we continue not to take the necessary steps and not to respond to the expectations of the young generation, I think then we will run into an intergenerational crisis. And this is maybe like in the late 60s in Europe, which means um, we have to face a revolting use because they feel that we, the old generation, do not fulfill our obligations. We are coming to an end uh, to this opening session, but I see, Arif, you on uh, business is always active. It's not only young global leaders. I think what is also very important is that business has been very much involved. I mean, I'm not speaking about the thousands and thousands of hours uh, of input by our Global Agenda Councils, uh, the experts, but business has been very much engaged and we are really, as the Minister said here, um, taking a multi-dimensional, a multi-stakeholder approach. But um, business, what would you like to add? Well, I'd like to add that I'm also very young, so I completely agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> Well, I think the most important thing that, from a business perspective that I'd like to point out is there is a serious danger of conservatism that is prevailing the world today. And we need, to, we need to watch that and we need to manage it. There was a survey done in the United States, and I'm sure it can be echoed all over the world, of a very large sample size where they asked them um, what would they like their savings rate to be. And most people responded between 15 and 20% of their earnings. And what I'd like to tell you is that the average savings rate in the United States is 1%. So to get from there to that 15%, the differential is telling you that the scars that people today feel as a result of the crisis are scars that need to be addressed. These will take a generation to work through, which is why I'm so excited by what you just said about the, the agenda for the young global leaders, because we've got to move off this conservatism thinking. We've got to encourage entrepreneurship. There is no two ways around it. We can be sitting here and talking big government. We can be talking large corporations. But we have to remember that 70 to 80 percent of the employees employment around the world in the organized sector comes from the small and medium enterprises. The SME sector is a critical one that has to be developed all over the world. It doesn't matter whether you're in Qatar, the United States, or in Singapore. This is an area of extreme importance because that's where employment comes from. That's where entrepreneurship comes from. And the last point that leads on from that is all of us have to start thinking a little bit more long term. We have to remember that these issues are not going to get resolved overnight. They're not going to be thought through and, you know, we don't have a magic wand. I'd love to have all of the things that you just said implemented, but let's be practical. It's not going to happen. But we can take steps to get there. And if we start thinking long term, the only example I can give is I, I have to uh, just tell you an anecdote. When Henry Kissinger went to China for the first time and he met um, Prime Minister Chu Enlai, he was trying to break the ice. So Mr. Kissinger said to Prime Minister Chu Enlai, he said, and he knew that the Prime Minister had been in Paris in his youth, he said, Mr. Prime Minister, what do you think the impact of the French Revolution was on Europe? To which Chu Enlai replied, I don't know, it's too early to tell. Now, that is one extreme example of long-term thinking, but all of us have to move beyond the immediate, have to think of an impending social crisis, and we have to start thinking as stakeholders. Business cannot think for profit. Business must not think only for the shareholder or indeed for the profit imperative. We have to all take a stakeholder approach because if we don't, and it doesn't matter whether you're a small business or a big business, you're going to be a dinosaur. I would like to take up what you just said, the long-term dimension, but before doing so, I, I listened with particular interest what you said about savings, um, because it reinforces the points that we may be the first generation, at least in many parts of the world, who is not anymore having as its aim, ah, the bird is back, good. Uh, who, <laughs> Who doesn't have any more? Like as, what I said, Professor. Who doesn't have any more as its aim to improve 
the life of the next generation. And I think this is reflected <laughs> in a lack of attention to education. It's reflected in how we handle our social and our health systems. And I think um, here a substantial rethinking has to take place. But let me conclude by saying uh, this Global Redesign Initiative should not be seen as an end in itself, but rather as the beginning of a sustained, and I uh, underline the word, sustained process to adapt and pre better prepare the global system for the challenges of the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all of you, I would like to thank Her Majesty again, His Highness, of course, for not only for his enlightening speech, but again for the hospitality and the panelists here at this opening session. And I wish you all a very good cultural evening, which allows us uh, not only to speak about such serious matters, but to cultivate what's at the end the most as important aspect of global uh, cooperation, a spirit of friendship and partnership. Thank you.